All right, we're in uh, Vancouver this evening to discuss with uh, Ms. Glenn Barley of Western Canada Wilderness Committee and uh, Professor John Calvert of SFU, the ramifications of the BC Energy Plan uh, in relation to native and non-native issues in British Columbia, and uh, also the uh, financial uh, results and the green energy issues around these water licenses. Good evening, Gwen. Good evening, John. Good evening, Good evening Tom. Maybe we could start with uh, with uh, Dr. Calvert in regard to the uh, green energy issues that we see these days in British Columbia. Uh, the move towards creating green energy uh, pretty much at any cost. Uh, well, the um, in principle, I think most people realize that we need to try and find a way to avoid climate change, and that if we can produce energy uh, in a way that doesn't uh, uh, exacerbate or worsen the problem that we currently got with global warming that would be desirable and hence uh, I think many people are sympathetic to the notion of green energy. Uh, the issue then is uh, how do you do that and what's the most responsible way environmentally to do that. Uh, BC is, is very lucky in the sense that we do have some resources uh, that are um, available to be developed. Uh, but at the same time, we have to ensure that we do this in a way that's very responsible and also that takes into account the fact that in, in building various projects, we can have very important and negative in, in impacts on the environment. So um, in terms of what's currently going on, I think that the, uh, the government has uh, basically not taken um, a very responsible approach in as much as it is not considering the overall environmental impact of many of the projects that are being licensed. And we've had what's called, uh, some people have called, and I think I would agree with this, a gold rush of uh, uh, private power developers who are rapidly acquiring uh, the uh, licenses for both um, uh, green energy in the form of uh, small hydro uh, and also uh, wind farm development. And uh, in terms of some of the research I've done, uh, of the 495 water licenses or water for power licenses that have been uh, uh, given out or are in, in the, the, the various stages of being uh, assessed and, uh, with a view of them being given out, um, these uh, are going uh, to various private power developers, uh, uh, about I think 196 of them to 10 companies uh, only. Uh, and this, to my way of thinking, is a huge giveaway of our uh, renewable resource future. Mm -hmm. On the wind farm side, um, again, the government uh, has been giving away vast tracts of land for the uh, development of wind farms. And all of this is in the context of, of the government not seeming to acknowledge that these resources, whether they be water or wind, uh, have enormous future value for generations to come. As long as the wind keeps blowing, as long as the rain keeps falling, we'll be able to generate energy from these projects. And so to give away for virtually nothing uh, the best of the run of the river or the best of the small hydro and the best of the wind farm location seems to me very, very short-sighted from the point of view of the public. Mm -hmm. And, and that, was the, that was also the concern of the Wilderness Committee, that with the um, loss of public control, that you, you have an erosion of democracy, and it's our belief that democracy is fundamentally good for the environment. And, and the other thing that, that was a real concern is with this proliferation, this gold rush of independent power projects, uh, you know, small hydro projects, that the government's not looking at the cumulative impact of the projects and the roads that they bring and the dams that come along, and they aren't looking at that impact on the landscape. And, the, and, and, and also, as we know with Bill 30, that the BC government introduced a bill that prevented um, local communities from being able to decide if uh, independent power projects were appropriate for their own communities. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a real a loss of democracy, that we have the erosion of the public good, and, and in a time when climate change is the defining issue of our generation and future generations, it's so yes. critically mm -hmm. important to be able to have public control over green renewable energy sources, especially with the decline of oil. And what we've done over the last couple of years is we've prevented BC Hydro, which we own, from developing new energy. And we have given over um, this, public, this incredibly valuable public resource to the private sector and are losing con on all the benefits that, that we had of uh, BC Hydro being a uh, Crown Corporation. 
I think Bill 30 was triggered by the fact that in a number of communities, uh, the local citizens felt that these power projects were not in their interest. And there's a variety of reasons for that. One is the negative economic consequences on areas like, uh, issues like tourism, for example, uh, kayaking, all sorts of other recreation. Um, and uh, by building dams and power plants on these uh, pristine rivers or beautiful rivers, uh, you have an enormous uh, impact in terms of the uh, uh, economy of the local community. Um, the other thing is that these are very capital intensive projects. So you have uh, an investment of say $50 million that generates two or three jobs in the community on an ongoing basis. And that's sort of public and, money. Yes, and, and the, the fact is that these uh, projects um, are not delivering significant benefits to the communities themselves. Uh, the investors are normally from outside the community and often outside the province or the country. Um, and at the same time, these projects generate an enormous amount of revenue. Um, the, the revenue uh, stream uh, from, uh, say, a 10 megawatt project might be uh, uh, 25 or 30 million a year, depending on the project. Uh, and uh, once the capital cost is paid for, these projects will run virtually forever. So uh, we're talking here about local communities essentially losing entirely their control over and their ability to generate uh, some benefit from these projects. Various uh, local governments were uh, basically not agreeing in terms of their planning uh, powers uh, that projects would go forward. And although the government was pushing them and pushing them and pushing them, because the local governments were being responsive to the interests of the people in their, that they represented, they weren't prepared to override the views of local citizens. And so in order to get some of these projects through, the government passed Bill 30. Um, arguably, uh, the Ashley project was uh, one of the main triggers, but more broadly, Bill 30 was a signal saying that what local communities want in this regard is simply going to be ignored if they're not willing to go along with the interests of the power developers. Yeah, which is essentially to take nothing mm -hmm. from the value of these assets and That's pass right. them into private yeah. hands. I think what's also uh, important, I think, for the public to understand is this, that uh, once a, a developer gets a, a water license or gets a, a, a tenure on, on potentially a wind farm, uh, basically they bid on into BC Hydro, which is now required to buy its new energy from private power developers. And once they've got a contract with BC Hydro, uh, then they can go to the bank and borrow the money to build the project. Uh, because the BC Hydro contract will give them a revenue stream of anywhere from 15 to 40 years, depending on the particular contract. And with that guarantee of public revenue, uh, it's a lot easier, of course, to borrow money from the bank because the bank looks at the, at the uh, potential contract and says, yes, of course, uh, there's enough money here to pay for everything. But at the end of the process, you and I as members of the public don't own anything, even though it's been our, uh, our revenue stream that's paid for the projects. And also, the other thing is from, um, I think, the point of view of the province, none of this contributes to self-sufficiency because uh, if the energy project uh, that's private wants to sell its energy to the U.S., um, given that the government has opened the grid to exports and given that the energy is private, very hard to keep it in B.C. So uh, essentially, uh, a project locate, located in the community can be generating in the future uh, a very large amount of revenue every year and providing almost no benefit either to the broader public in BC or to that community. I and think that's a good point because what you said, we've gone from being owners of BC Hydro to being mm -hmm. renters and having to buy our power back from um, private power producers mm -hmm. with the independent power projects. And the thing that you know, BC Hydro gave almost $700 million in revenue annually to the BC economy. Mm -hmm. And so now instead of that money from, from Run of the River projects coming back to British Columbians to build mm -hmm. schools, to build libraries, to build in, you know hospitals, mm -hmm. it's now going to go to line the pockets of investors. All of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's a huge, huge giveaway of a mm -hmm. resource that will be for generations to come. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, many people are not aware of how valuable these resources are going to be down the road. So we're seeing them as essentially being given away at a time that the public is not fully in the picture in terms of understanding the consequences.